Let me say again, I'm Dave Weber from the head of corporate relations, I hear it working now, uh, in the Office of External Relations, and I have enjoyed being here at MIT Sloan for the past couple of decades in a variety of roles, so I'll maybe say a little bit more about that uh, preceding some of our other speakers. Um, it's a real pleasure this morning to have as our leadoff hitter, Professor Shane Frederick. He is the uh, Seraphim Family Career Development Professor in, in Management and focusing in the area of marketing, and in particular, some interesting behavioral and decision-making aspects that I'll know he'll uh, get into a little bit later. He's one of a number of our faculty who look at how people make decisions both in the financial world, in the marketing and purchase kind of world, and in other aspects of uh, consumer and individual behavior. So I think you'll really enjoy uh, hearing from Shane this morning. We've worked together in the past uh, when I ran the Management of Technology program, and he was teaching our core subject in marketing for that program, so we've collaborated together a number of times, and in fact, both of us share undergrad heritage from the University of Wisconsin. We're both Badgers, and I'm very pleased to have Shane with us this morning. So let me, without further ado, introduce Professor Shane Frederick. So uh, I guess, is my mic working? It sounds like it is. Uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Welcome back to the classroom. Um, I just have a short handout, which has been passed out. And it shouldn't take about three or four minutes. I'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out. Four of the five questions are uh, pertinent to today's presentation. The fifth one, I agreed one of my graduate students to put it on there as a filler question. So. Um, but anyway, if you just want to take a minute or two and um, complete that, and then you can just pass it to the left, and I'll pick them up later. I'd really appreciate that. And we'll be going over some of, the, uh, some of those questions today. And I'll be talking about uh, the relevance to time preference. So uh, this is a graph. So, this, this slide, uh, so today I'm going to talk about time preference, how people care about the future. Okay, so we actually have 45 introductory slides before we get to the title that you see on your paper. But I'll try to proceed very quickly. So um, this is a, one of my favorite graphs. This is quite a remarkable study. Uh, it's Max Henry and Brooke Fischoff, published in the Journal of Physics in 1985. And it shows estimates of the speed of light okay, in kilometers per second as measured starting 1870 up to about 1983 when they pretty much nailed it. And uh, so it turns out that it's 299,782 kilometers per second. But there's two things about this graph that I think are fascinating. Uh, first, these are point estimates, the best point estimates of the speed of light, and 95% confidence intervals. Okay? <laughs> these are 95% confidence intervals. Okay? This is the truth. <laughs> so 95% of the time, these things, the bars should cross the line. Okay? So you should see here, basically, there's about 31 different studies estimating the speed of light. And so 5% of them, right, about two, right, should, should fall outside of that line. But in fact, you see a lot of them falling outside of the line, right? So people are, since those scientists were way too confident in terms of the amount of knowledge they had. But one thing you do see in this graph, and it's to be contrasted with what I'll be talking about, you do see certainly some sense of methodological progress, right? both in the sense that the error bars are getting smaller and they're getting closer to the truth. Right? So you see, certainly, over the course of 100 years of research, uh, you know, a lot of progress towards the truth. Now contrast that with um, estimates of <laughs> the discount factor. So the discount factor is the sort of a parameter which uh, kind of measures or captures how much people care about the future. So this is delta, it's called delta. So one means that I care equally about the future. Something which occurs 30 years from now, I give it just as much weight as something which occurs tomorrow. Okay. Zero means basically, this is like sniffing glue. It's like this is something which gives you a rush and has some terrible, terrible future consequences. Okay. So basically you're saying, I give, no, I give no weight whatsoever to the future. I, just, I, I, don't, I, just, I want the high now, and if it damages my brain, who cares? Basically, so you might think this is sort of the extreme, right? This is the extreme version of that. It just give no weight whatsoever to the future, okay? And something and everything else in between. As you can see here, and it's a contrast with the previous graph. There's really been no methodological progress, right? We're not getting closer to some to some idea of what the average discount rate is in society. Right? You just see fantastic variation across studies, and that's what I'll be looking at today, trying to explain that or understand that a little bit. Um, so over here, really quickly, talk about discounting. Let's just skip this. I'm going to talk about stuff. Um, 
So many, not all choices, have an inter intertemporal component. Intertemporal just, temporal just means time, into across time. Okay. So you can think of something like, and so in many cases, the benefits precede the costs. Okay. So drinking, drinking alcohol, right, is an example of intertemporal choice. The high precedes the hangover. Right? Now it could be, it could be reversed, right? It could be the case where you drink and you, know, you drink some substance that gives you a hangover, and the next morning you just feel this euphoria, <laughs> right? <laughs> now. Now, if that were the case, there'd probably be less drinking, right, than there is now. <laughs> and we might, we might, if that were the case, we might call drinking a virtue rather than a vice, if in fact that were the case, but it's not. Uh, okay, and of course, the reverse of this is something like jogging, right, where the hangover precedes the high, right? And it's, it's not fun to wake up in the morning and be, ga be gasping for breath for 30 minutes, but later in the day, maybe the next day, you feel good. So it's sort of, in some sense, the opposite of drinking. Uh, education, you might think of boredom, you know, precedes the income, sort of an, inter an, 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 an intertemporal choice as well. So certainly a lot, a lot of choices certainly have this property, right, where the costs and the benefits don't occur at the same period in time. And so whether you do it or don't do it, it's going to depend on how much you weight those future benefits. Obviously, there's complex cases like tanning, for example, sort of boring and often you get a sunburn and that's bad. And then later you get a tan and you're attract more attractive and that's good. Then later you get wrinkles, and less attractive and that's bad, right? So you kind of have this complex pattern of costs and benefits occurring over time. Um, and certainly distribu distributing benefits, you think of a lot of cases as you know, how much do you want to you know, consume now versus saving for retirement. There was a nice commercial I saw the other day talking about you, know, you buy a diamond necklace for $13,000 and the, the compounded opportunity costs of that at retirement are like $60,000. So you can think of it, you know, if you think of it in those terms, you're losing a lot of future benefits by consuming now. Um, certainly not everything has this property, right? If you choose between Mexican food or Greek food, I mean, it's just a different set of flavors on your tongue, but there's no, in no important sense is it really intertemporal. If you go to, choose to go to Alaska or Paris on your vacation, right, it's, it's, it's a choice, but it's not in any sense really an intertemporal choice. So not everything has this property. But certainly a lot of important life decisions sort of have this characteristic. Um, so most formal analyses of intertemporal choices have been dominated by the discounted utility model. I'm not going to get into the math of this, but basically it just means so delta is less than one, right? So this is, the, the assumption here is that people discount future utility in the same way that bankers discount future streams of income. Okay. And so delta is less than one, so obviously delta to any power is less than one. Right? And you're, getting, you're giving less and less weight to the future, basically, to future outcomes. So if you think of like learning SAS, right, which I actually gave up trying to learn because this, this period is just too long, right? <laughs> But basically here, these, this, this is the, this is, these, these are the, the boxes of the utility that will actually be experienced, and the dark part is the part that you're going to count. So I just call these sort of utility ghosts. Here, this, this is a utility which is going to be experienced but not counted because I don't care about the future. So for example, I, might, I, I didn't learn SAS perhaps because I discounted this long stream of benefits that I was going to get from sort of mastering a better stats, stats program because it was in the future. At least that's one explanation. The other explanation is that I thought I maybe just could never learn it. But Anyway, so the, the, the exact delta we use is important for lots of different types of decisions. There's lots of people have used this model to try to understand you know, which compensation packages will people like, whether women should or should not get elective hysterectomies, because you have some chance of operative mortality, but it prevents uterine cancer in the future. Should you discount future life years or not? There's lots of debate about that. No real resolution about that. Um, and certainly um, you know, many, many other cases, including intergenerational discounting, which I'll get to today as well. Um, so, the, you know, given the importance to, you know, given the importance to public policy decisions and private decisions, there's been a lot of attempts, both by psychologists and economists, to measure this, this um, to measure delta. Um, so, some people use experimental studies, much like the ones I gave you today. Which would you prefer, $100 now or $140 in one year? Try to measure people's discount rates from that. If you prefer the $100 now, it means your discount rate's more than 40%. Okay. Um, complete the blank. Some people have used field studies to look at choices among refrigerators. Some refrigerators are more expensive, but they're also more electrically efficient. So it's kind of an upfront cost now versus you know, some benefits in the future of using less electricity. And try to sort of impute the discount rate from choices like that. Uh, here's the direct measure. So you use something like this today in your survey. People haven't used this very often, but a check for $100 redeemable today immediately, a check for $100 redeemable in one year. What would you prefer? Most people prefer prize A. Compared to the other prize, Compared to that prize, the other prize is what? You know, worth nothing, my delta is zero. Equally valuable, delta is one. And this is just a direct measure. If you think of a 10 centimeter scale, you can just measure it directly off of this. You just literally, literally measure people's deltas uh, right from a, from, a, from a survey like this. Okay. 
Um, now, of course, that's not necessarily going to correlate with other measures of delta, and that's a big part of what today's talk is about. Um, but is any, again, has anything been learned, right? We've used all these things, we've used all these different measures, and it doesn't really seem like anything's been learned. We still don't know what delta is or if there is such thing as a delta. It's like I deny that there really is a single, you know, unifying, underlying monolithic construct that sort of can explain all these choices. Um, so why do the estimates of delta vary so spectacularly across these different studies? Uh, <clears throat> so it's because inter intertemporal choices reflect a lot of different things, okay? So they could reflect, possibly, I think there's not a whole lot of evidence for this, this hypothesized factor expressing the weighting of future, the weighting of future utility. How much do I care about future utility? So that's part of it, perhaps. But a big part of it is all these factors which, which affect the, expect, the expected amount of utility that I'm going to get from something, including, of course, uncertainty. If something doesn't happen, then it's obviously not going to get any utility or disutility from it, right? Things are often discounted because people are uncertain they'll happen. Opportunity cost of capital. If I, don't, if, I, if I don't have the money now, I can't invest it. I can't get a real return on my money. Okay, utility of anticipation. We'll talk about this. Sometimes I actually might, look, actually might prefer to put something off because I get pleasure from looking forward to it. Right? I might prefer to get a, a Red Sox tickets in two weeks because I'll just have this pleasure of looking forward to going to the game. Okay, that I can experience over those two weeks, and then experience the game, and then get utility from the game itself. Uh, contrast effects, I might, I might like the idea of an increasing, increasing income over time, because I look back at my previous student self and think of, oh boy, I was poor. You know, I'm so much better off now. And I, I derive some satisfaction from the knowledge that I was once poor. Right? Uh, if I was always rich, you know, then it wouldn't, I wouldn't be as satisfying to me. Okay? And of course, the tastes may change over time. Some things I may not care about, because I may, may predict, correctly or incorrectly, that my tastes will change. Okay, so <clears throat> these considerations are relevant to different degrees and different decisions, and they may be evoked by different measure, measurement procedures, and that's part of the reason you get this you know, variation across studies. Um, so I, I want to illustrate the diversity of, of these considerations by noting a paradox, okay? The paradox is that most studies imply that the future is valued less, okay? Delta is less than one, except for one case here. All the studies are less, all the studies are less than one, okay? Equal less than one. But sequence studies imply the opposite. So there have been a few studies, a much smaller set, where people said, have you rather had, would you rather have an increasing sequence or a decreasing sequence? This could be anything. This could be money. It could be scoops of ice cream on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and minutes of sunshine, you know, whatever. Good, good things. Okay, and most people say, I prefer this sequence to this sequence. Well, these two facts are in direct contradiction to one another. Right? And to see this, as well as to illustrate my, my PowerPoint prowess, just note that if we took these two pieces, thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> and move them over here, right, we'd of course create the improving sequence. But of course now we're taking two units of consumption, moving it forward in time, right, and that, that makes it more preferred. But of course that violates the assumption that good things moved forward in time are discounted, weighted less. Right? So, so we have these two sort of big sets of data which are in direct contradiction to one another, or which appear to be in direct contradiction to one another. And that's what I'm going to try to explain. Okay? It's actually true that improving sequences are evaluated favorably in three different senses. You can think of things, which do I prefer, looking forward in time, which sequence do I want? If, I want to, if I'm going to go to a double header, you know, do I want the Red Sox to win the first game or the second game? Right? Most people say, I want the Red Sox to win the second game. Just have a preference for improving sequence. Okay? Obviously, it doesn't matter in the standings, right? They're one and one, and they maintain whatever lead they have over the Yankees. Um, but uh, so preference, people prefer improving sequences. Experience, it's not as clear. There's been a lot of studies. Some find that people experience it better, some don't. So if you can imagine eating jelly beans, black licorice, and then strawberry in one of two sequences, most people prefer strawberry, I think sensibly. Um, then, uh, then, and actually, you, you, you can actually measure people in, and they're eating this and they're measuring how much satisfaction they're feeling. And it actually, if you just said integrate the total satisfaction, it actually really doesn't matter much. What, what sequence you eat them in. There's actually another, there's a study done by Geneva Williams in, in the Oklahoma City of Music, which I think is fantastic and really undersighted. But she actually asked um, the music faculty there to compose a symphony based on these three minute clips from these different sort of orchestral compositions and to try to create like a, a symphony. And uh, there was actually a lot of agreement across the faculty how you should order these to create the best experience for listeners. And she had listeners in the audience, 400 listeners, and they had these ratings, these buttons, and she would, they would basically slide them up and down saying, how much are you enjoying the concert right now? So you get some kind of measure of total enjoyment over time. Okay, so that was one condition. The other condition, she just randomly, she just basically took the 10 pieces and put them in random order, just randomized them, and had people listen. There was almost no difference. Almost no difference whatsoever. So this expertise, in some sense, that the music faculty had was pretty modest, 
right? It didn't really increase people's experience very much. They really didn't care. Their, their, their actual on-time, real-line experience was essentially independent of the order of these things. Okay. And in memory, people look back, they remember, you know, the Red Sox won the second game. They, remember, they just remember the entire doubleheader more favorably. Okay, so there's lots of evidence for this. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to prefer improving sequences. In some sense, maybe it shouldn't be a surprise why people do. Okay, so there's anticipation. You think of these are scoops of ice cream on Monday, Wednesday, and you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You're just thinking, God, Wednesday's going to be great. I'm going to get all that ice cream. Okay? Uh, contrast effects, similar thing, right? Looking back, you're like, man, these three scoops are great. Monday, I only had one scoop. This is really fantastic. I really get the sense that my life is getting better over time. <laughs> Extrapolation could be this, right? So this, I think, is actually a problem with these studies, is that people see one, two, three, you just normally think four, five, six, right? Uh, even though you're not really supposed to be sort of considering that. And, and possibly, I think it's a pretty small consideration, the utility of memory, yeah, I prefer it because I know that when I, when I look back, I'll remember it more favorably, and utility from memory is some component of my preference. So there are reasons to prefer it, but there are competing reasons as well, right? Uncertainty, maybe, I, maybe the ice cream store will go out of business by Wednesday. Maybe I'll die before Wednesday. Uh, <clears throat> right? And if you, think of, if you think of money, right, obviously it, it, has, it helps to get it now because I can invest it now and earn some interest, okay? And you might just, and of course this is the pure, the pure delta, I'm just really impatient. I just, want, I just want it now because I want it now. No other real reason. And there's some other reasons. Diminishing margin utility, you just want this, right? The third scoop of ice cream doesn't really confer as much utility. Usually you're kind of stuffed after the second scoop. So it's probably better just if you can have six scoops of ice cream, just to have two, two, two every single day. So <laughs> that's going to sort of kind of suppress either, either type of preference for improving or declining sequences. Okay? Um, so again, different procedures evoke different considerations. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but some of the reasons you see this is because when you see a choice like this, you think uncertainty, investment, and patience. When you see a choice like this, they're specifically linked to one another in time. You might think of stuff as anticipation, contrast effects, and of course you could get extrapolation also. You see these sequences. So you tend to go from getting positive time preference to negative time preference. I'm going to show that when people allocate something over time, you think of allocation, you think of division, equal division, you tend to get essentially no time preference. People think of equality, the 2-2-2, two, 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 basically. And pricing sequences, strangely enough, you, get, you tend to get positive time preference again. So we asked some people, if you could allocate, you could allocate 30 goods over time, how would you allocate them? And um, this is movies. Suppose you could only see 30 movies over the next eight years. It's actually a hardship for most people. They see about eight per year. So they would, this, you know, how, how, would you, how would you like to allocate this over time? And we also asked for massages and headaches. Okay? You had 30 intense headaches. How would you like to allocate these over time over the next eight years? 30 massages, which most people enjoy but really won't, won't purchase. How would you allocate those massages over time? And uh, we find actually that people, when, in, in the allocation, this is really the dominant preference. It's just flat if you think of equality. And in fact, you, we don't get preference for improving sequences here. People are pretty flat for movies. They're actually impatient for massages. And we'll see pretty, really quite impatient. And for headaches, you get this bizarre pattern, but this is some. <laughs> This is some people, this is, not an ad, this is not individual, right? This is aggregate data. So some people say, I'm going to put all of these things off until eight years from now. Maybe they'll have a cure for headaches by then. Maybe I'll be dead by then anyway. It won't matter. Um, so you see this, kind of some, some kind of fancy pattern overall. Um, something kind of interesting. We asked people, uh, you could have sort of a really nice uh, French dinner or kind of a crappy Greek dinner. And, uh, and we asked people, which would you prefer? Which sequence? You can have Zorba's Grill this month and Cafe Matisse next month or Cafe Matisse and the Zorba's Grill. And uh, most slight majority preferred the improving sequence, the better thing later. But when we asked them, what did you pay more for? A certificate that gives you Zorba's Grill this month and Cafe Matisse, or Cafe Matisse and Zorba's Grill? No, most people would pay more for the declining sequence. So this is weird, right? This is called, it's called a preference reversal. We have two different measures of preference here. One's, pay, one's pre preference, a direct, you know, how, which do I prefer, A or B? And the other one's a measure of willingness to pay, which we ordinarily think would you know, correlate perfectly with preference, right? I would pay more for the thing that I prefer. We see here a, a contradiction between those two things. And it's probably the case that this, is, this violates people's expectation, right? I don't normally pay more to have good things later. You know, when I order a book, I don't say, you know what, I'll give you five bucks extra if you delay the shipping a little bit, right? It's, <laughs> it's very, be very unusual, right? But it's still, it's, it's, this is still a really interesting preference. If you, if you put both these, both these two together, people are totally consistent. So they understand that they have to give the same answer, right? People either, in this, in this study, people either saw this or they saw this. They don't see them both together. If you put them both together, they say, well, I have to, I have to answer the same way. They, they, so, they, so they tend, and the question is, which do they, they tend to coordinate on? 
tend to coordinate on their pricing or their preference. Turns out that they coordinate on their, on their pricing. They think that sort of the economic mindset is sort of the rational mindset. So it looks very, very much like this when you put them both together. Okay. Um, there's another interesting thing, same, same, kind of, same kind of phenomenon. We ask people, and we do studies like this, we ask people, you could, if you had to participate in the three-part psychology experiment, and it was going to occur in these three days, which would you prefer? Uh, in one case, you get electric shocks, and then they have blood withdrawn to measure the level of stress hormones. That's <laughs> not pleasant, right? It, in the other case, you have to hold your hand in ice water for a minute and rate the level of pain you experience at various moments. It's not pleasant either, but it's not so bad. And I've done that before. And in the other case, you have to count the number of times the word the appears in four paragraphs. That's boring, but it's not particularly unpleasant. Okay, so and they occur in one of these three orders. We said, which did you prefer? Overwhelmingly, people preferred to get it over with, to get the bad one over with. They didn't want to have this dread of sitting there Monday and Tuesday thinking, oh my God, Wednesday, it's coming up, it's coming up. <laughs> Just get it over with. But again, if we ask people, well, how much, how much compensation would you demand to participate in this three-part experiment? We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't find a difference, so it's kind of offsetting this preference. And um, the most interesting one is the one that I asked you about, actually. So uh, I asked this, I asked this to 243 people on the 4th of July in Boston, just before the fireworks display last year. And uh, so the same kind of preamble that you got. Uh, I've done this before, by the way, six level tablespoons of ketchup. I've eaten it. it. It's really not very pleasant. And it's surprisingly unpleasant, but it's not harmful, right? I mean, I'm still here. And uh, so, so this is something which most people would do Nearly everybody would do for money. Right? People vary on how much money they would demand in order to experience this unpleasant event of eating all this ketchup. But uh, so one condition, people have said, if, if you sign up for the study, when would you prefer to eat the ketchup? So much like the previous study, people overwhelmingly said, I'd prefer to eat it later today. Okay. So then he said, the other group got, how much would you have to be paid to consume the ketchup? Now notice that if you prefer to eat it later today, that means that you know, that's the event you prefer. It means in some sense, you wouldn't have to pay me as much. Right? I prefer it. It's less bad to eat it today. You, wouldn't have, you shouldn't have to pay me as much money to eat it today than eat it in the future. Because after all, I prefer to have it today, so you know, do it for less. But that's not what we find. And this is really dramatic preference reversal, right? You know, it can only be 100%. That's the biggest difference you can get. 100% choose A in one condition, 100% choose B in the other condition. And this is getting pretty close to that theoretical maximum of how big of a preference reversal you can get. People actually tended to demand more today, even though they preferred it, right? So this is a real sort of, there's sort of no coherence in people's preferences in some sense. And this is sort of what, uh, you know, many people uh, in decision theory study and sort of fascinated, you know, and are fascinated by is this kind of complete incoherence in people's preferences. So this is really a dramatic illustration of that. Um, so the imputed delta right, is, is, is sort of biased by all these considerations, which aren't really strictly delta. They're really about how much utility I expect to get from an experience in some sense, right? So they're really, there's the suite of these other considerations that really ought to be in the utility function, not really in the delta function at all. And I guess the question I want to ask is, does delta belong in the model at all? Um, can, can, can choices be explained without referring to this sort of hypothesized construct that people give less weight to future utility? I think often it can. There's certainly some, some choices which challenge it, though. I think some cases you do need it. So we ask people, for example, I'm really surprised by this. So I, I like massages, so I think of this as sort of pure pleasure, right? You might think of this as essentially utility. Exactly the kind of thing we're talking about. How much pleasure do people get? And we ask people, what would you prefer, a 30-minute massage in the next two weeks, any time in the next two weeks, or a 45-minute massage any time in November? So most people enjoy massages, won't pay for them, but do enjoy them. And it certainly would go if they had a free ticket. And overwhelmingly, people preferred this. Now, I think this is just a mistake. Why? Well, you'll still be alive in November, most likely. You're probably still going to enjoy you know, pressure on muscle tissue. Right? You're still going to be stressed and tired and sore. You're still going to enjoy it. And 45 minutes is better than 30 minutes. Right? You really should take the longer one. It's still part of your life. Okay? So I think, so here's a, here's a very strong preference. So in some sense, I think it's hard to explain this preference in terms of any of these things. Probably can only explain it in terms of time preference. Okay? So yeah, I think it does belong in the model, although I think these account for a lot, for a lot of variance. Um, so I guess the, the philosophical question I'd like to raise is, you know, can delta less than one be justified? And so economists generally say, yes, it can be justified. You know, there's no arguing with tastes. If you don't care about the future, well, that's fine. If you like apples to oranges, I, well, how, how can I argue with that? If you want to sniff glue and you get this great high, even though it destroys your brain, yeah, that's, your, that's your preference. It's rational because yet just the way you care about the future. So economists generally, generally adopt this perspective, although there's some tension even among economists because you see here, among the sort of the 
uh, almost the archetype of neoclassical economists, they say, although fully myopic behavior is formally consistent with our definition of rational behavior, should someone who entirely or largely neglects the consequences of his actions be called rational? Okay. And this is, and so they, you see the tension even there. Most philosophers would say, no, delta less than one cannot be justified rationally. So John Rawls says, rationality requires an impartial concern for all parts of our life. The mere difference of location of time of some event is not a rational ground for having more or less regard for it. On this view, on this view discounting is irrational because rationality is a consistent plan to maximize utility over time. Okay? In discounting opposes utility maximization. If you prefer the sequence 1, 0 to the sequence 0, 1, it's pro and it's a strict preference, it's probably the case that you prefer 1 minus epsilon, right? 0 to 0, 1, which means that in some sense, this is your life, these, both these periods are your life, it means that you prefer 1 minus epsilon to 1. Well, I, you know, if you prefer something less or something more, then in some sense, someone who discounts is surely not maximizing her good. Okay? That's what the philosopher John Broom says. So I, I find this argument pretty compelling, okay? that in some sense, there's, there's, there's no rationality for it. But the most provocative argument is by a subset of philosophers, most notably Derek Parfit, uh, who says, yeah, delta less than 1 can be justified, right? Because our future selves have the status of other people. He says, we can care less about our future because we know that less of what currently matters, our present hopes, plans, loves, and ideals, will survive into the future. If what matters holds to a lesser degree, it is rational to care less. My concern for my future may correspond to the degree of connectedness between me now and myself in the future. And since connectedness is nearly always weak over longer periods, I can rationally care less about my further future. And so a movie which I liked, which sort of, I think, in some sense encapsulate this, is The Fly. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a great remake of, a, of an older film. In 19, I think it's 1986, Jeff Goldblum, Gina Davis. And uh, so in that film, Seth Brundle, who you see here, starring, starring Jeff Goldblum, it has a teleportation device, which can sort of literally teleport him from one side of the room to another. But in the teleportation device, when he first tries it the first time, a fly gets into the machine. And it fuses him and the fly at a molecular genetic level. And when he reappears in the other pod, you know, not at first, but he's actually starting to turn into something else. And over the course of time, he becomes something different, okay? So by this point, he knows something's sort of wrong, okay? <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is it still, so he's, he's, he's starting to have some fly characteristics, some, some, both, in fe both in feelings and in appearance, and sort of knows that, you know, he's starting to wonder, you know, is this still me? Is, is this still me? And what, what am I going to become? Is the thing that I'm going to become still, still me, right? And a couple, a couple weeks later, of course, it's clearly not Seth Brundle anymore, right? It's, just, it's sort of this hybrid, this genetic hybrid Brundle fly, in some sense, right? So now the question is, you know, ought Seth Brundle care about this, the, the future utility of Brundle fly? It's not clear, right? It's still partly him. It's not entirely him. So suppose that he could put away money now such that Brundle fly would have whatever Brundle fly likes in the future, right? Would he really want to save any money now, right, for the future utility of Brundle fly? It's not clear, right? It's not clear there's any sort of strong normative mandate to sort of, sort of, you know, to make sure this thing that's maybe partly him is better off. Okay, so and if you read, if you if you read, uh, I went, to, went to the David Cronenberg is the director of this film. Went to his website, and he's and he said that he he wanted the film as a metaphor for aging. Okay, and so you think of this. This is obviously an ex, you know a much more extreme version of what normally happens over the course of a lifetime. But very clearly, we do change over time, right? Our, I mean, all the molecules in my body now actually will be gone by about seven years. They'll all be replaced by other molecules, which are currently in tomatoes and corn and pork and things like that. Okay? And so I'm going to, in some sense, be a completely different person. At a molecular, at, all the molecules will be gone. I'll still have some memories and so forth. I'll have different tastes. I'll have different interests. I'll, I'll, I'll look different. And so to what extent does, does this metaphor sort of hold for individuals? And this is what, this is what, this is what, he, what he argues. And I think it's a provocative argument. And so if just, just to summarize, the economic view is that, well, anything's rational. I can, care, I can care all or nothing with the future. That's whatever. It's your own preference. It's your own deal. I, they're all fine. They're all rational. Rawls would say, no, we have to give full weight to all future events. You shouldn't, you shouldn't discount the future at all. And Parfit would say, well, it depends how connected you feel to your future self, in some sense. You can discount to the extent that you feel disconnected to your future self. Um, so the... the uh, how much is connectedness diminished over time? This is one of the things that I've, I've sort of measured, and one of the things the question I asked you today is the first, first question on the survey. Five years from now, I will be, you know, how, how much do you think it'll change over time? And when, I did, when I did this before with a, with a group of people who, age, who range in age very broadly, I found that, uh, that and I sort of matched people up. So 
I looked at a 21-year-old predicting a 26-year-old, and, and, and also the 26-year-old actually was supposed to look back, and he said, when you were 20, you know, five years ago, when you were 21, how did you feel? I did the same thing for pairs of people at different ages. So 37-year-old predicting a 52-year-old, 52 would look, look back at when he was 37, and say, how similar were you? What I generally found is that people did not predict as, did not predict as much change as they reported. So when they, when they look, looking ahead, think, I don't change that much. But looking back, they go, oh, I actually changed a fair bit. Actually, so people actually experience more change than they predict. And so in some sense, you might say, so people do expect and report a lot of change. And you might say, does this support, you know, Parfit's idea that there's some rational basis for discounting? Perhaps. Similarity diminishes more quickly when young. So teenagers, much like you might think, right, it sort of makes sense. They say, I'm going to change a lot. By the time you're 40, like me, you say, no, maybe I won't really change that much anymore. My sort of identity is sort of fixed at this point. You do, in fact, see that in the data. Um, and the other thing is that the predicted change is less than reported change. So you might say maybe people don't discount enough. Right? They're actually changing more than they think they're going to change. Um, but anyway, that was the results from that study. So I'm actually going to skip this now. I'm actually going to skip this part in the, in, this, in the interest of time. But we looked at intergenerational time preference and find that it's very, very sensitive to the, to the way you ask the question. So this is, so I've actually replicated uh, this study which says that people discount the future very, very heavily discount future generations. So here you see people are choosing 100 lives now over 7,000 lives 25, 25 years from now. This suggests a fantastic, you know, people, people don't, don't care about future generations. But if you ask a question different, you ask a question a different way, you get very different answers. Okay. Matching this, and just spectacularly different answers. So in some sense, this is just, I think it sort of invalidates the previous research. Because like, these are totally, you know, sensible questions to ask. And um, so this is my favorite one. Um, program A will save 300 lives in your generation, zero lives in your children's generation, and zero lives in your grandchildren's generation. Program B will save 100 lives in yours, 100 lives in your children's, 100 lives in your grandchildren's generation. Now, if you really discount the future, program B should be awful. Right? Because you're taking, you're taking all this discounting, which is, you know, all this life saving, which is valued now, and you're pushing those 200 lives that you're going to be saved, and you're pushing those off to future generations, you know, which we don't care about, right? according to the previous research. Right? So people should hate program B, right? but as you can see, you, know, you can feel it, right? Program B seems right. You know? It seems like you ought, to, you, know, you ought to be fair in some sense, some interdirectional fairness. In fact, that's what you find. So 80% of people preferred program B. So these are just you know, spectacularly different results than, you, than, than, you would, than, you'd impl than you'd infer from the previous research. Okay. Um, so anyway, so this is the previous research on this topic, and this is my research on this topic. And, I mean, it's just, you know, it's qualitatively distinct, let's say, right, in terms of how much, you ought to, how much weight people actually do place. To say nothing what they should place, it's not a, a normative issue. How much, people actually, how much weight people place in the future generation. It's very, very different. Um, so I'm going to skip all this and get to the last 10 minutes where we'll talk about the title of my talk. And uh, so we've been looking recently with this two, two of my colleagues um, one at Florida and one who was at Durham Business School in, in London or actually just south of London and um, we've been looking at when, when you describe future events you can describe future events in different ways and how does that affect people's time preference okay. so one thing one of our first studies we, which um, which we published recently is we is we asked people two different we asked people to think about the future in two different ways and this is fairly the fairly near future we're talking months weeks stuff like that okay not decades away. And so for example, say it was October 7th, 2007, and we were thinking of an event, perhaps a receipt of some money, which would occur on November, on November 16th, 2007. There's two ways we could say it. We could say in 40 days, or we could say on November 16th. Right? These, occur, these refer to the same objective state of affairs. And what we find is that people are spectacularly more patient when you use dates. Okay? Here we see. So here we see people are really impatient. You want 904 months or 1,220 months. Most people go for the 904 months, okay? But here, we see four times as many people are, are, are going for the later large reward when you frame it in terms of calendar dates. Um, so I'm just going to skip this, skip this. So what's going on here? Uh, one thing is a discount. So discounting is closer to the rational ideal with date representations, right? People are discounting less, more like they should, right? More in the order of 5 to 7%, you know, still way more than that, but closer to that at least, closer to the rational ideal. Uh, and nevertheless, it's interesting, if you put these two side by side, the, the delay representations trump. So if you say, in seven months, on October you know, 16th, people, 
people uh, act as though they saw it in seven months. In sense that they, they sort of discount the other perspective if they see them both side by side. Um, and it's, it's kind of striking that you see this, you know, given the familiarity of both types of representations, right? We say stuff like this all the time. Let's meet same time next week. You know, no, I'm meeting them, but I'm free on the 23rd or the 25th. You know, we're used to both of these frames, right? We see them both, and yet people act very, very differently, framed in one, in one way versus another way. Um, so what are some explanations for this effect? Dates are more precise and therefore less uncertain. You know, it's, we don't really think it's that. Because okay? again, why does the both condition act differently? Um, partly we think it's this. If you say 100 now, 120 in nine months, they say 100, 120, that's 20 percent. You know, and they go, oh my god, but I gotta wait three times as long. People just spontaneously do these kinds of ratios in their heads when they see these numeric representations. So they go, I gotta wait three times as long for only 20 percent more money? Feels like a bad deal. But here you say, 20% more money, how much longer do I have to wait? Uh, I don't know, I guess we're both the same. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So you say, well, I might as well go for the larger amount, right? And it's really not too much more complicated than that. I mean, we think this is really a big part of the effect. I don't think it's all the effect, but, but it's a big part of it. Another possibility is that maybe, maybe the, it just actually feels closer. Maybe the calendar date actually feels closer to you. So we thought this ought to affect all types of judgments, not just, not just uh, judgments about money, but rece receiving money. So he said, if the future really feels closer, then maybe we, it could affect judgments like how much a baby will grow. So we said, a baby, a 12-week-old male baby weighs 13 pounds today, okay? which is about what they usually weigh. And uh, we said, how much will this baby weigh when he's 36 weeks old? That's what one group got. Another group got on May 5th. They thought, These are, this is we're exactly 24 weeks away from the time I asked the question. Okay, so they were matched. And so we thought, if, if in fact, uh, people think the time, that this actually feels less, they probably think the baby has less time to grow. And the baby will be smaller. They predict, they predict the baby will be smaller. And that is, in fact, what we found. Okay. This is, the, the baby was thought to be significantly smaller in this representation, which is predicted to be, than in this representation. In fact, in fact both are overestimates. The, the baby will actually only weigh about 21 and a half pounds. Okay. So it's, there's some support for that. Um, I'm going to skip this. It's too long. And just talk about uh, the last part, which is, uh, which is you know, the, more, the, more lo the longer time frame, right? So the, 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 the uh, when I get older, losing my hair. Uh, so that song, a famous song, actually refers to the future in four different ways. Getting older, many years from now, when I'm 64, you have dates. This album was released on June 2nd, 1967. Paul McCartney turned 64 on June 18th, 2006. So we see all these different ways of referring to the future, okay? And um, <clears throat> what we found is that, uh, a very close cousin to the other effect. If you ask people, $40 immediately or $250 in 10 years, people are pretty impatient. Another group got $40 immediately and $250 when you are 49, in my case. But we had it linked, they entered their birth date and the computer changed it, you know, and you got essentially 10 years from now. So if you're 38, you got 48, 58, you got 68, and so forth. Okay? And you see, these are dramatic, people are dramatically more patient in this case than they are. And so we're trying to understand this effect as well. It's interesting, this effect, by the way, does go away when people, when people get old enough. So we broke people down by decades. Those in their 20s show the effect. Those in their 30s show the effect. 40s show the effect. And this is the age representation. And this is the, and this is the in, in, in 10 years representation. And you see this effect for everybody, but when pe people who are 60 and up do not show the effect anymore. So they're, in some sense, perfectly coherent in their preferences by that time. Maybe because they get used to thinking about the, the age in both, both ways more commonly or something. So. That was sort of interesting. Um, and so we find, actually, it's really interesting. We find the same effect here. We say, this is really a subtle frame. Um, if you say $500 in four years, $1,800 in 11 years, or you can say, uh, this, should, this should be $500. $500 when you're four years older, $1,500 when you're 11 years older. So that's very, very similar. In four years, when you were four years older, you know, these are the same things, right? But we actually find that, that both the age representation and the years older representation, which maybe gets us to think about ages, people are much more patient. Okay? So it differs across problems, but people are much more patient in this case. And so what are some thoughts about this? It's a very large effect. It's robust across procedures. It's stronger than date delay effect. Unlike the other case, if you present both simultaneously in 10 years when you are 48, people act like they saw when you were 48. So they don't think about it naturally, but when you, when you give them that perspective, people are much more patient. <coughs> We actually didn't. We thought we'd see big, big threshold effects, like 50 years old would be like a big threshold for people. And if they were 47 in five years, oh my god, I'll be over 50. We actually didn't see that. I was surprised. I thought we'd see that effect, but we did not. Um, so what are some explanations? Uh, similar explanations to the other one. I just want to close with what people said about this, okay? Um, 
I don't know whether it does this. Does it sort of highlight our continuity of identity? Because some people, we did this with pictures, and they're like, it actually had the opposite effect. They're like, my god, I'm, I'm kind of a totally different person. So it may, have, it may actually have the reverse effect. It may have different effects for different people. Um, and people, it may be that it, thought, it primes thoughts of older people. And people generally think that older people are more patient. It turns out not to be true. In our data, they're less patient, actually. So in some sense, you know, maybe there's a good reason for that, maybe not. But, but uh, there's this widespread belief that people are more patient, and they're not, at least not by any of the methods that we've used. Um, so does it alter perception of temporal distance? That's one idea. Right? So we said, gasoline costs 287 today. How much will it cost in seven years? What will it cost when you are 46? And we find, much like the baby case, that, that people think that it seems as though people think less, less time is passing. Gasoline is going to go up less. Okay, 15 years, same thing. Baseball tickets are going to go up less. The average baseball ticket costs $22. What will it cost in 15 years? What will it cost when you are 54? Similar kind of thing. The global climate warming will be less bad when you're 54 than in 15 years. Okay, so I think the temperature will go up less. So we see these effects. It brings up a real paradox is, is that we ask people to describe. So what we thought was happening is that people would think that maybe people thought the future is closer. So we asked them, here are three descriptions. They're all the same. You can see they're all the same. But which one feels furthest away? Which one feels closest? We had this description. So I'll, just, I'll conclude with people's answers, which I will say dramatically refuted <laughs> what we thought was going on. What we thought was going on is that the future felt closer in time. Um, so remember, people are more patient. They think the world is changing less when you refer to ages. So you might think that's in, that, that could be explained in terms of the future feels closer when you say ages than when you say delays. That's definitely not what's going on. Here's what people said. When thinking about age, I think about all the years in between and all the events that will take place each year, making it seem farther away. When saying 15 years, it is impersonal and seems to be taking, talking about just my time, not my life. Interesting. Picturing myself as a 52-year-old just seems a lot farther away. I feel and look younger than my chronological age. And it just seems like it will be a long time from now. However, when I just read the, data, the date by itself, not in relation to me as a person, I can see that it is not so far away at all. Dates feel close because they are tangible. There's something about 15 years that seems farther away than the date. It's hard to grasp being 48, 46. Even though I know it's only 15 years away, I don't feel that close to quote unquote middle age. 15 years feels closer because the years go by so quickly. I'm only 44. So when you say, when I'm 59, it feels furthest away, because I will be getting close to retirement age, which seems to be far in the future right now. I feel so young now that 34 seems really far away, like it should be more than 15 years away. Uh, since I consider myself young, thinking about when I'm 33 seems very far away. I can't imagine myself when I'm that old. <laughs> uh, 15 years doesn't, even sound, doesn't sound that far away because there's a smaller number and I can't even fathom being 41 yet. And 2002, 2022 sounds like some time frame they would use in Star Trek, way in the future. <laughs> 15 years feels closest because there's a fixed quantity of time. 47 years old feels really far away because that age is completely irrelevant to who you are now. Wow, how intimidating. This shows me how quickly I'm aging. The date feels closest because 2022 just does not sound so far away. The age seems farthest away because seeing the age 65, well, it's hard to imagine being 65. It makes me think of the Beatles song, When I'm 64. <laughs> that sounded like such an old age when I was young. Quite amusing, really. So anyway, we're out of time. I'll just close with that, but thank you. <laughs>